Oh man, I almost didn't make it. Hi, welcome everybody to Family Time. Ooh, we're so glad that you're here. Um, I'm Ivy and this is Daniel. Um, and today we're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, the letters in Revelation. And um, you know what? Now I'm having trouble rem remem remembering what, uh, what, what are you wearing? Oh, oh yeah, my mask. You're right. My bad. Oh, nope, let me that get is that over. Not what I was my referencing. Ears. Yeah, that's uh that's that's more what I was talking about was uh what what's happening in the um hearing region. Oh, Ivy. Yeah. Did you not hear the news? <laughs> <laughs> Ear pun. Uh, okay, seriously though, did you not hear the news? We're going through Revelation, uh -huh. and I took a sneak peek at the scripture today, and oh, I cool. saw oh, several times our scripture mentioned this whole thing about having ears to hear, so I thought I'd get one step ahead of the game and get my own ears. I so, see. Okay. Uh, that way I can hear better. Okay, once again, you're almost on target, but never really on target. As normal. Right. Makes sense. Um, so the letters in Revelation are talking about those who have ears to hear. So there's all these letters in Revelation that are written to the church at the time, and they finish all these letters by saying those who have ears to hear, which just basically means everybody because everybody has ears to hear basically oh. but it also means like if just because you have ears doesn't mean you're actually going to listen so i mean the elf ears are very are you saying handsome but they're not they're not really the point well then what am i going to do with these i got you a pair of jingly ones that i mean it's also a child size so it might be like four sizes too that small is for really your head nice but, of you. That's but i did think really... that would be better but it's actually a great point Good. that you it looks fantastic Thank wow you. it's I actually a great it. point that you mentioned that though because mm -hmm. it makes me think of a verse can i get my bible really quick oh yeah sure. one second ow, ow ow okay we're fine i'm fine He's i got very it. graceful i got it i got it i got it, I got it. <laughs> i'll fix my foot later it's okay, okay. It's um, fine. we have a nurse oh perfect here we go, James 1, verse 22. It uh -huh. says this, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Mm -hmm. Do what it says. So it's saying yeah. that, that we can either listen to the word and not do what it says, mm -hmm. or we can listen to the word and do what it says. And I think that's kind of what you're saying, right? He who that. has ears to hear, let them hear. It doesn't just mean you're going to see the words that are there. You actually have to follow through with what God is calling us to do. Danny, right? you got really deep just then. Like, I'm really proud of you. It happens sometimes. You actually like, got hey. it right. Sweet. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Hey, so by the way, because of that verse, that reminds me, we have a challenge for you guys this week. We want you to talk with your family and ask them and ask yourself, how can I listen better this week? Do you That's think you so can listen good. better this week? Maybe a little bit. Maybe with the ears, not so much. Maybe, maybe not with so much. with these off a little maybe bit better than these. normal. That maybe the, both of them at the both? same time might. Yeah, a little quadruple. My head's so massive though. I feel like it's like I have that just four really ears good. on top of each other. You're but a real it pro. looks good to me. You're yeah. such a pro. All right, Daniel. Do you have any announcements for us this week? We sure do. We actually have two of them for the high school students and middle school students. We have our Sunday morning chats that are from 11:30 to 12:30 this Sunday morning. So be there as soon as the service is done. Probably you can hop on. Have some fun. We're going to play a game, have some time for small groups, okay. and get to know each other even better. But then tonight, talk about getting to know each other better. Yeah. We have our Crowded House kickoff. We have snow cones for you guys, Ooh. and we can't wait for you to get to know your leaders a little bit better. It's going to be so much fun. It's from 7 to 8 tonight, right after the outdoor worship service. That what about y'all? That's great. That's awesome. So we also have some Zoom room chats right after the service. You don't want to miss those. And those will be at the, at the link below on the bottom of your screen. We also have our Sunday morning videos there. Also, look forward to October. October, we're gonna rethink the whole trunk or treat thing. We're gonna have a little carnival cruise and you're gonna drive through. It's gonna be awesome. That's so look awesome. for information about that coming soon. We can't wait to see you at the Zoom rooms right after this. Y'all have a great Sunday. See you soon. Bye. Bye.
morning, Grace family. Will you please bow your heads and join me in our morning prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today to worship and praise your holy name. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Everything we need is found in you. For those of us who come here feeling broken, bring restoration. For those of us who come here feeling weak, bring strength. For those of us who come here with doubts, bring faith. We open our hearts and minds and souls to worship you. We thank you that in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see your love, justice, mercy, provision, and victory. You are the God who lifts up those who are weighted down. You are the God who provides for your children. Our desire is to praise you as long as we live. We come to you as we are, called to be saints, holy ones, but so often less than our calling. We confess we often fall short. We take our eyes off of you and our lives reflect that. Forgive us those times that our thoughts and actions are not pleasing to you. Help us this hour to let go of those sins to which we cling. Help us to know our self-worth does not depend so much on our ability to hold on to our lives as on your power to release ourselves into your hands. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins and for your grace that saves us. We lift up our world to you, your creation. As humans, we can forget that you have created the world and are not absent from it, but all powerful in it. There's much hurt, confusion, unrest, illness all over the world. You are the great healer. We pray for healing in our world. We pray specifically for the eradication of the coronavirus in your way and in your time as only you can do. We lift up the leaders of our world, our nation, our state, our city, all of those who are in positions of authority and leadership. We pray they will honor you and respect you as the one and only true God. We continue to lift up those impacted by hurricanes and wildfires. We pray for restoration and peace in those places and for those who are living with the consequences of these disasters. We lift up our church, Grace Church, to you, Lord God. Come be with us, inspire us, and lead us in the way to go. We pray for our current leadership, for our staff, and for the ones that you are preparing to lead us forward. We pray for our congregation. Grant us unity and perseverance, as well as love and concern for one another. You know all of the cares and concerns on the hearts of your church and your people, both spoken and unspoken. Thank you for hearing our prayers. We are grateful that your promises are true and your goodness never fails us. We are grateful for your forgiveness and for your grace. We trust in you, Lord God, and we rejoice in your love and faithfulness. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Mine are days that God has known 
Good morning, Grace friends and family. It's good to be with you today. I have a good word for us. It is from James 1 17 and it reads, all generous giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or the slightest hint of change. God loves us deeply and he pours out all his blessings over us daily. Even in the storms of life, we do not fear because we serve a God who loves us, who is generous with us. And that is how we are to respond back to him with our generosity. Second Corinthians reads that each one of us should give just as we have decided in our heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but because God loves us and because God loves a cheerful giver. Our response back to God's blessing is to bless Him with our faith, with our generosity, letting His gifts expand the kingdom of God for others who are struggling in their storms of life. We'll hear the good news. We'll have hope. We'll have the light of the world and the love of God to carry them through. God bless you as you give generously and as you love deeply. Good morning. My name is Karen Welton, and I'm an elder here at Grace. Dear Grace family, I write this letter in hopes to encourage and also challenge you. Our church community has experienced so much change and pain over the past years. COVID has been the toughest because it has separated us from each other. Have we let it separate us from God? Have we forsaken what we are called to as our first love? Have we become like the church in Ephesus? Revelation 2, 4 says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. So many of our Grace family are giving up, moving on, because things aren't the way they like. I also know there are many who have worked hard for years and now have grown tired tired of trying and weary of seeing nothing change. When will we see a youth ministry that is transformational for teenagers? When will we see all our efforts to create discipling communities take root? What has happened to our commitment to God and our neighbors? Do we think someone else will take care of it? I don't think so. The Grace family I know and love has worked hard side by side through hurricanes, denomination changes, pastor and staff changes. We rallied during our community outreach as in Project 180 and the Friends of West Chase. So what now? We need to re-examine our hearts, turn to God and let the Holy Spirit work within us. We need to pull closer together in creative new ways. It's time to break out of our rut, reach out to our neighbors, call friends, and draw back together to our community of faith. We can begin by asking God to search our hearts. Where do we harbor grudges, disappointments, frustration, apathy with all that has happened at Grace? Then ask the Holy Spirit to clean house, renew his spirit within us. Kingdom work is a marathon. We need to reassess, re-engage, and join back together in the body of Christ. Paul's prayer to the Ephesians in chapter 3 is also directed to us. He said, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Together we have power. Did you hear that message? With all the saints, that's you and me. You have been planted where you are during this time for a purpose. Seek the Lord's guidance and see what new paths are opened. Mark 12, 30 through 31 gives us the basic command. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. We're told it takes all our strength. So let's not grow weary. Let's finish this race well. I invite you to come back. Work, we work best united. Don't give up. 
please keep investing in this kingdom work. As a church, let us return to our first love. There's an exciting journey ahead of us. I feel it. I close with a prayer of love for you, which comes from Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Without wavering, let us hold tightly to the hope we say we have, for God's promises can be trusted. Think of ways to encourage one another to outbursts of love and good deeds, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming back is drawing near. Amen. Good morning. It was so good to hear that letter to the church family from Karen Welton. And over the next several weeks, we'll be hearing other letters to our church family from other folks in our community. These are letters that are part of our next sermon series entitled Letters to the Church, in which we look at the seven churches in chapter two and three of the book of Revelation. Now, I know when you hear me say the book of Revelation, you start thinking something like this. Oh no, Revelation, that's that book filled with weird and strange images and prophecy and end of the world kinds of things. Well, interesting, Revelation literally means apocalypse. And sadly, in our day and age, this word has come to mean something like, oh no, something terrible is about to happen. And we use it to talk about storms and disasters, these horrible things, these apocalyptic in proportion kinds of things like the fires out west and storms along the Gulf Coast. 
But this isn't how the people in the first century understood this word. They would have thought of something much more immediate and inviting that would impact their daily living. For them, the word simply meant an unveiling. It was used to lift the cover off of a box or to pull back the curtain in the theater. The word meant opening up. So that is our hope as we look at these seven letters over the next seven weeks to the churches in the book of Revelation. It's a hope that Christ would invite us into an unveiling, a revealing, a taking the cover off and pulling back the curtain on our church and our faith practices to help us understand what it truly means to be the church of Jesus Christ. So before we turn to our scripture reading for this morning, I wanted to share one insight about the seven letters You see, each of the seven letters is structured in a similar manner and follows a pattern. First, there's the description of Jesus. Then there's the diagnosis of the believers being addressed. Next, there's a directive to action, followed by a danger to consider. And finally, there's a declaration of promise. So now, will you turn with me to the letter to the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance, and I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor, You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear the Spirit say to the churches, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Let us pray. God, we ask now that you would reveal, that you would unveil, that you would open up these words, your scripture, your words to us. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. So in verse one, we see the description of Jesus. He is the one who is speaking in the vision that the apostle John recorded. It says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Jesus is expressing the significance between himself and his church. It connects us back to Revelation and the symbolism in Revelation 1.20 that states, the mystery is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lamps are the seven churches. So the Ephesians need to understand that it's he who speaks to them, the Lord of the church. The angel who is the messenger is in his hand and the church the recipients of the letter are in his presence the symbolism is to show the reader that the lord is sovereign that he's powerful that he is the one sending the message and is present among them next we discover the diagnosis of the church's spiritual condition in verses two and three this includes the recognition of the health of the church Jesus praises the church with the things he knows. He says, I know your deeds. I know your hard work. I know your perseverance. I know your purity of morals and from false teachers. And in verse six, he acknowledges that their attitude toward the practices of the Nicolaitans, it's, uh, it's false and it's bad practice of doctrine. However, in verse four, Jesus recognizes what is not healthy in the church body in Ephesus. Jesus says, I hold this against you. 
You have forsaken the love you had at first, your first love. But what does this mean? This is where the directive to action helps us understand Jesus's condemning word to the church of Ephesus. In verse five, Jesus says, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. The action Jesus is directing is repentance, which literally means to to turn around, to do a U-turn, to do a 180 degree turn of your heart. Jesus is saying your love has been misplaced and misdirected. You have lost the focus of your heart. He wants them to consider. He wants them to remember where they once were spiritually. Did you notice the word first is used twice in verses four and five? Jesus is saying, go back to where you were at first, not to the works, but to the love that was once expressed in those works, in those deeds. You've abandoned that love. Here is a church that was absolutely committed to guarding, but no longer giving. Here was a church family committed to a Christ-centered confession, but no longer a Christ-centered compassion. Jesus doesn't simply want them to tweak and tinker with their church programs and activities. He's using a strong and forceful word, repent. The seriousness of Jesus's words are evident in the warning that he gives about the danger they should consider. Jesus says, do the things you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This is serious. Since the lampstand is symbolically and it represents the church, then what else can it mean but the church in Ephesus will no longer be a true church? When we think about this, it shocks us, it surprises us, and maybe even grieves us. Is it possible that even today that the church across the country and around the world still holding worship services and maybe even active in the community, but there's no longer a lampstand. There's no true light because the love of Christ is no longer first in the hearts and the minds of believers. This is difficult to hear. And it's hard to reconcile in our minds that Jesus would do such a thing. Now, this brings us to the next section of the message, the declaration of the promise. You see, the Savior's desire is not to remove their lampstand, but to fan into flame the love they once knew and had, their first love. He eagerly wants them to repent and turn and come to him. Jesus in verse seven reveals his heart for them. He wants wants them to hear. He wants them to be victorious. He wants them to eat from the tree of life. He wants them to experience paradise with God. This is part of the gospel story, the good news in Jesus Christ that harkens back to the beginning in the garden of Eden when that sinful consequence blocked them from the access to the tree of life. Yet it also points to the promise of God of his restoring work of making all things new in Jesus Christ for those who have received Christ as Lord and Savior. And in the end of Revelation, it paints this incredible picture of this paradise with the tree of life, with the 12 kinds of fruit that are available to every month of the year with leaves for healing of the nations and the people. So this morning as I wrap up, I want us to consider why does this matter to us? How should this challenge us and change us? While we understand that Revelation was written to real churches, we must remember that it was written to seven real churches. And in scripture, seven is symbolic, a symbolic number to represent completion, perfection, and wholeness. While this message was sent to the church in Ephesus 2,000 years ago, the Lord of the lampstand declared these words to all seven churches and to the entire church throughout all ages and time. 
Well, as I wrap up this morning, I want us to consider why does this matter to us? And how should this challenge and change us? Well, we understand that Revelation was written to real churches. We must remember that it was written to seven real churches. And in Scripture, seven is a symbolic number to represent completion, perfection, and wholeness. And while this message was sent to the church in Ephesus 2,000 years ago, the Lord of the lampstand declared these words to all seven churches and to the entire church, regardless of geography and chronology. We, Grace Presbyterian Church, we must hear these words of the one who walks among us, who continues and still speaks to us. I believe that Christ is pulling back the curtain on our church. He's taking the cover off to reveal and unveil to us the realities of being the church of Jesus Christ and our practices of faith. Are we devoted? Are we faithful? Are we God's faithful people? And what does our faithfulness look like? Is it gathering for worship in person or virtually? Is it serving among us and across the street and around the world? Is it committed to healthy teaching, to giving financially, to opening up our homes for community and to our neighbors? Is it carefully and prayerfully seeking and selecting leaders? Is it equipping people for discipleship? And is it not giving in or giving up in spite of the challenge we face as a church? I believe Jesus is pleased with such expressions of faithfulness. But is there love? Do we really love one another? Do we love our community? Is the love of Jesus evident in us and through us? If we're not serving one another, if our hands are not extending to comfort and support one another, if our words are not full of grace and truth, if our hearts are not breaking for those who are dying, then there's a problem with the body of Christ. So let's hear and listen to what the Spirit of Christ has been saying to his church for 2,000 years. Remember, Repent and return to your first love. Amen. You broke my chains of sin and shame and you covered me with grace. And you mend my Yeah.
Well, before you receive the benediction, let me share a few announcements with you. First, don't forget to go to our website to download and utilize the Grace Home Liturgy Guide throughout this week to extend your time of worship. Then tonight at 6 p.m. out on our field, we're going to have our outdoor worship service. We'd love for you to attend and participate in that. And then finally, next Sunday, October 4th, we are going to live stream our World Communion Sunday service. And following that, we will have a congregational meeting. There'll be more details throughout the week in our communication to you. But now receive this benediction. As you remember your first love, may you cling to the love that God the Father has for you. May you remember the abundant and amazing grace you have in Jesus Christ. And may you be led by the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. Amen.